My name is Ruth Garside. I'm an associate professor in evidence synthesis based at the University of Exeter, which is in the southwest of England. And I'm also a co-chair and editor of the methods group for Campbell. So thinking about evidence-based decision-making and the role of systematic reviews, you're probably very familiar with a version of this evidence hierarchy, um, which shows systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials with or without meta-analysis at the top of the, um, the pyramid with other study designs offering less robust evidence. Um, but this depends on what we think of as evidence and what kinds of questions we're trying to answer. So this kind of hierarchy of study designs is really about the kinds of questions that ask what works, what, interve what interventions are effective. But there are other questions which are important and useful for practice and policymakers. So what works is not the only question, that can be usefully addressed um, and systematic reviews of RCTs are not the only high quality evidence in a policymaking context. So there are a range of questions which qualitative inquiry can ask. Here are some examples. Things like, what's it like to experience this condition or this situation? What are people's experiences of receiving an intervention which has been developed to help them? Which aspects of that intervention might matter and why? How does it help them? Are there any unintended consequences that haven't been measured in the trials? Are there particular contexts or circumstances that support success? And how do we go about achieving that success? What do people think about it? So this is a whole range of useful and important questions which the RCT is not well designed to address and qualitative inquiry can address. Another way of thinking about qualitative findings and where they might be useful is to think about the stage of the policy cycle. So in the initial stages when policy is being developed, it might be really important to explore and understand the nature or scope of a problem. And this kind of information can come from people's views or experiences, and it might be a whole range of different people, depending on your question or your policy. So consumers, healthcare providers, other professionals, policymakers themselves. You might also want to understand why a particular problem has arisen. Why is this a problem that needs to be solved? And that might help you to understand or frame a particular problem more conceptually. As you're deciding what the problem is and what you might need to do about it, it may be helpful to assess the different policy options that are on offer. So this might include things like trying to understand how people value different policy options and um, their views about the different options on offer. It might also be useful to think about how acceptable a particular um, policy might be and whether it's feasible to be delivered at the particular level that you want it to be delivered. The other thing that it might be really useful to do is to think about not just what the intervention is, but to articulate how an intervention might work. And this can be particularly useful for complex interventions where there are a number of interacting elements that might operate at different levels of a system and where the relationship between the person delivering an intervention and the people receiving it might be particularly important. So being able to articulate how an intervention is believed to work can be really, really helpful. Another stage of the policy cycle where qualitative insight might be helpful might be thinking about implementation strategies. So how to um, put something into practice. So Talking to relevant actors in the system can help you to understand the factors which might affect the implementation of a policy option and the views about those implementation strategies. And then finally, once a policy has been implemented, then monitoring the effects of this policy option can be useful. And that's not just about effectiveness, but it might be useful to understand factors which influence how that policy is being implemented, as well as things like fidelity, that's whether or not the um, 
the intervention ends up being delivered as planned or if it's adapted by people in the field and whether there are unexpected um, or adverse consequences that hadn't been anticipated. So here's another, you know, sort of list and range of options which um, qualitative research and qualitative evidence synthesis might help to elucidate. However, what we often find is that the question qualitative research is asked and qualitative evidence synthesis is asked is what are the barriers and facilitators to successfully implementing something? And this has in some ways shows the way in which qualitative research has become more acceptable. Um, but it also shows that there's perhaps um, from my perspective, a lack of clear thinking about the range of things that a qualitative evidence synthesis can actually address. And this graph just shows the increase over time in the um, number of publications which have barriers and facilitators in the title. So I'm not saying that this is never a useful question. Um, I've done qualitative evidence synthesis with this title, but it's just to sound a note of caution about how you think about qualitative research and the way in which it can be used for evidence synthesis. So one of the things um, which I think is a bit limiting about this question is it tends to see the world in terms of pluses and minuses or snakes and ladders, things that help and things that hinder. And this way of addressing the problem, I think, can encourage you to think in a very dichotomous way. It's either um, helpful or it's not helpful and potentially can encourage list making over meaning making and really trying to understand what the implications of the research that you're looking at um, can be for the problem that needs to be addressed. In particular, the labelling of whether something is a barrier or a facilitator can be really arbitrary. So I have seen reviews that look something like this, um, where barriers to successful implementation might be things like high cost or poor communication between the person delivering and the person receiving the intervention or inaccessibility due to physical or financial factors. But this list could equally be expressed in the opposite way and it's about the same thing. So for so facilitators are low or no cost, good communication and accessibility. And this is what I mean about list making rather than meaning making. And also um, shows that where the things are considered barriers or facilitators, in many cases can be arbitrary because it just depends if they're expressed in a positive or a negative way. So instead of thinking of things as snakes and ladders, either good or bad, I'd encourage you to think about them um, contextually. And the pictures on this slide are of um, styles. And styles are a very common feature of the UK countryside. They occur on footpaths and they're designed to allow walkers to pass through fields, fences or gates but to make sure that the animals who might be in the field, the cows or the sheep, can't pass through. So the context for these different um, styles impacts on who can find something accessible and who cannot, whether that's somebody trying to cycle on one of these paths, they might be able to get through this one at the top, um, but not some of the more complex styles. The creatures can't necessarily get through, but some dogs can get through underneath. So rather than thinking of snakes and ladders, think about the contextual factors and the specifics of the populations about whether a feature in your synthesis acts to support or obstruct what people are trying to do. The other key issue I have with that barriers and facilitators question is that it doesn't necessarily articulate at what level these barriers or facilitators might be taking place. And they can occur across macro, meso or micro levels. So the macro level might be things that are related to communities or society as a whole, things like social determinants of health or legislation, but they can also be things like um, institutionalized racism or um, 
a patriarchal society. They're very um, large societal impacts that might have a role in, um, in impacting on whether or not something is successful. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they can occur at a MISO level. So this might be about groups and the relationships between groups, for example, patients and clinicians. Um, and particularly thinking about power imbalances or the way in which groups can be functional or, or dysfunctional. And so those factors which might influence whether or not an intervention is successful can be about these relationships at a group level. And then finally, they might be about um, factors related to the individual. So this might be their perceptions of what they need or what's wrong, their expectations of the roles that they have. Uh, to make or not make changes. And when you ask those barriers and facilitators questions, I think it's really useful to think about at what level you're interested in terms of the factors that might influence success. And remembering as well that these things don't happen in isolation, so they interact with each other. For example, um, if an individual perceives that they're being talked down to or discounted by the clinician, that might influence how willing they are to accept a particular sort of intervention. And those kinds of attitudes might also reflect, the, reflect these larger um, societal or cultural factors which influence how people perceive their role or the expectations of them. Another thing um, to think about is that if you're asked that barriers and facilitators question, and we do find that policymakers can um, resort to that kind of structure, that when um, evidence is needed to position a policy agenda, the initial framing might only represent the dominant view. And what that means is that you're assuming that the activity or an intervention is agreed on as desirable by all the people in the system, including those who are delivering it and those who are receiving it. So it might instead help to understand different key actors, attitudes, perceptions and preferences. You can't assume that the um, intervention is universally regarded as desirable, uh, which again, that framing of the question of barriers and facilitators tends to assume that it's already been agreed that that's a desirable state of affairs. So how do we mitigate against this kind of potentially restricted thinking, uh, which these questions might um, engender? So this is an um, incomplete list, but considering interactions is important. How do different elements or different levels, the macro, meso and micro interact with each other? Do they exacerbate or mitigate against each other? And when you're reading qualitative um, evidence to think about what does it actually mean, not just what was described. As qualitative researchers, we're used to interpreting the data. And so trying to understand what people say means in the context of the question that you're trying to answer is a really important part of the synthesis. Also at the beginning of the process, really thinking about what the key people and processes are that you need to understand in order to help make sure um, that uh, something is possible and feasible. And this might include psychological factors, social, systemic factors. It might be operational or financial. It might be about different people um, or it might be the, about the system as a whole. Um, and again, thinking about what are the key actors, expectations or perceptions. And the other thing that's really important is to give yourself time to refine, refocus and adapt the question. We often see that people almost tag on a qualitative question onto a quantitative review question uh, without giving space or exploration to think about it. And um, talking about refining the question, this is a framework that actually comes from, from my thesis, which was trying to think about good practice in the conduct of systematic reviews of qualitative research. And just to enlarge those first three points, these three um, sections about developing the research question, scoping and identifying relevant literature 
really are very iterative and overlap when you're thinking about the sorts of questions that qualitative um, evidence synthesis can um, be useful for. So it often starts with developing an initial tentative and broad question, uh, which might be based on researcher interest or commissioner interest or policymakers questions. And then doing scoping to understand where relevant research has been done um, and identifying where the main kinds of research is, seeing whether or not you've thought of all the key actors and systems that might be important, then using that information to refine the research questions and to focus in. And that might involve things like thinking about what theoretical framework might be used to understand the evidence, um, as well as considering whether or not you need to split down the question into a series of more focused review questions to help with searches and inclusion. And as the Cochrane Qualitative Group says, by their very nature, qualitative reviews ask how and why questions. So the review embodies a process of discovery and learning. And it may be that as you start to scope the literature, your question becomes refined or the populations that you're interested in change or expand. So it's a process of discovery um, with questions often being exploratory, at least to start with, aiming to understand what's known from multiple perspectives and to reveal different factors, dimensions and explanations. Um, and so this process means that these initial qualitative questions may be broad and then you need to map what is known before formulating or refining the questions that an evidence synthesis can address. So my next few slides are really thinking about the steps um, involved in developing a good question for qualitative evidence synthesis. So initially, you may want to think about how to frame the problem. So you need to make sense of the problem that you want to address. What is it? Are you trying to understand what people's attitudes are to experiencing a particular situation? Are you trying to understand something about um, the implementation of an, in, of an intervention? Are you trying to understand why certain sorts of interventions might be more or less successful um, with it to address a particular problem? So you can then try and start to think about what aspect of that problem the qualitative evidence synthesis will address. And then once the initial problem has been understood, you can start to refine the question. So this is to understand the context that the question is being asked in, who's the um, audience, what are the relevant settings, whose are the relevant perspectives and so on. Um, and understanding how the evidence base helps us to think about the relationship between the problem and an outcome um, and how this can help us to ask better questions. And one way to do this is to use existing concepts um, or um, uh, conceptual frameworks, logic models and so on to really articulate what's going on and where we think issues might arise. So um, theories of change and logic models can be really helpful, particularly when you're asking a qualitative evidence synthesis question, which relates to a quantitative question as well, and can help draw those two bodies of evidence together. So then um, there needs to be some scoping to try and understand the amount and quality of literature available across those different um, contexts and participants to understand which disciplines have focused on, on that literature, that can help to refine where you need to conduct your searches, and whether there are key theoretical or conceptual frameworks which are relevant to the topic. And that might just be um, as background to inform your questioning, but sometimes conceptual frameworks can be used as analytic tools as well, such as if you're doing a framework synthesis. Um, once you've done that initial scoping, then you can explore um, or refine alternative formulations of the question. It's really useful to check in with stakeholders at this point. There's people who might be using the evidence or people who commission the evidence. And again, um, using a question framework and or a logic model or um, theoretical framework to help refine the question can be really helpful. <clears throat> 
So these steps of questioning and consulting are really key. Um, consulting with experts in the field, with policymakers, with practitioners um, is incredibly useful. Um, consulting early, often and widely can really help to sharpen your understanding of the purpose of the review, the possible audiences and the possible impacts. And again, just thinking about possible areas of inquiry. So this is really some of the things that it's useful to talk to um, uh, stakeholders about is to understand what, what would be useful for them to understand. So when we're talking about interventions, uh, this might be questions of feasibility. So for example, understanding whether an activity or intervention is physically, culturally, financially, or practically possible within the particular context where people are wanting to apply it. To understand where the strengths and weaknesses are or the threats and opportunities um, to rolling out a particular kind of intervention and understanding the factors which are likely to affect the outcome of the activity. A second set of um, areas of inquiry are around appropriateness. So this is things like in what ways do the intervention or activity fit with the situation of the people on the community in which it's delivered. So these are where it can be really under, useful to understand what people on the ground feel about a particular situation which a policy or practice is aiming to change. Um, and so trying to understand whether or not it will be acceptable and accessible for the people you're trying to reach. And if not, why not? <laughs> um, whether the outcomes even of the proposed uh, activity or intervention are desirable um, for those people who you're aiming them at and if they're consistent with their values and beliefs. Another area of inquiry is around meaningfulness, the meaningfulness of an um, intervention or an activity, whether or not it resonates um, with people's experiences or opinions of the target group, um, what it means for them to experience this, how people understand um, a particular problem or feel about potential solutions, how this is affecting the practice or experience of the group. Another um, area where qualitative evidence synthesis can be really useful um, is around questions of implementation. So if you have uh, an intervention which you think works in one particular setting or context, um, is that going to be appropriate to be delivered in a different setting or context? And so you really want to try and unpick what the process for delivering a particular intervention or program actually is. And again, you know, with complex interventions, this can be really, really important um, to understand what the complex components of an intervention are, how they work together to produce an effect and how you can support them, how you get people to engage with an, in, implement, um, an intervention. And also, um, as I said earlier, around implementation for fidelity, whether or not it was delivered as intended. Um, and as well as the people who receive an intervention, implementation issues might be particularly around provider experiences of delivering a project and understanding whether or not they were able to deliver it as intended or if they um, used workarounds to try and make something work or stop doing something because there was too much resistance to it. So understanding those things, again, can really impact on whether or not a project which seems to be successful can be scaled up or, or rolled out to other localities. And then finally, um, questions of equity can be really usefully explored um, using qualitative evidence synthesis. So thinking about the ways in which an intervention may have reduced unfair differences in benefit and harm among social groups. So, Sometimes um, interventions have the capability to exacerbate existing inequalities or equity issues, um, almost always unintentionally, but understanding those equity issues can be a really good task for qualitative evidence synthesis. So, um, the next section of my presentation is thinking about ways of um, getting the question right and using structures or uh, frameworks to 
produce or, or frame the question. So the first thing to think about is whether your question is going to be standalone or if it's related to a review of intervention effectiveness. So standalone qualitative evidence syntheses can be really useful from the, at the beginning of a, a policy cycle where you're trying to understand what people's opinions or experiences are of a particular situation, problem or condition, which can then go on to help inform future work. It might also be related to a review of intervention effectiveness. So thinking about those questions previously around implementation or um, acceptability, um, that might be related to an intervention effectiveness review. Of course, the question needs to be important um, to decision makers, policy makers, or um, other groups. It needs to be answerable and it needs to add to the literature and the understanding of a particular problem. The questions that you form can be exploratory and often are exploratory for qualitative evidence synthesis. And we can think of them then as um, acting like a compass where the question guides your levels of um, engagement with the literature that's out there. Um, whereas other sorts of questions might be very fixed um, and you can think of these as an anchor. So they might be narrower questions. And often these are the ones where you are relating to specific issues around implementation and you want to have the questions very closely fixed to um, particular implementation um, intervention issues. Using a structured question, uh, just like for quantitative reviews, can be really useful because it helps define the boundaries of the review, uh, can go in a protocol, and can help to inform other stages of, of the review, including searches, eligibility, and, and synthesis. And those things will be familiar, I'm sure, to most of you. So um, thinking about using these frameworks to refine a question, um, we know that this can be helpful as a planning tool. Um, conceptually, it helps to identify the research uh, components and will help you to scope the literature and the evidence base for question components, which you might want to refine and develop. On a practical basis, it helps with developing the search strategy, defining inclusion and exclusion criteria, and considering what to extract and code in the synthesis. Um, and as I said, it forms the basis of the protocol that you write for your qualitative evidence synthesis. So question frameworks, you're probably familiar from effectiveness reviews with the PICO framework, population, intervention, comparison, and outcomes. One qualitative evidence review question is also called PICO, but with a small O. And this thinks about the population, the intervention, and the context. So you get slightly different um, ways of defining those questions. There are a couple of other examples for reviews of qualitative research. One is SPIDER, um, which looks at the sample, that's the population, the phenomenon of interest, uh, that's uh, what, what you're interested in, uh, the design, so that's the type of um, qualitative research that you're including, the evaluation, which relates to how you're going to get the answer, so that might be things about people's perceptions, experiences, opinions, and so on, and research type. And this research type allows you in a mixed method synthesis to say whether you're interested in qualitative, quantitative, uh, or mixed method studies. There's also SPICE, which is very similar. Uh, in this case, it talks about setting. So that's where something is happening. The perspective, that's who. The intervention or phenomenon of interest. So this can be used for standalone or intervention relevant um, reviews. Comparison, if that's appropriate. And evaluation, again, this is about the types of findings that you will um, use in your qualitative evidence synthesis. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Um, these um, actually come from two related reviews 
which themselves were part of a much bigger project trying to understand about interventions for children with ADHD which were delivered in the classroom so non-pharmacological interventions delivered in the classroom and we did a series of quantitative and qualitative reviews to try and address these issues and then also tried to bring them together in an overarching synthesis but this is just to show how these um, different parts of the evidence base can help to build, build up a useful picture. This first review that I'm going to talk about um, was about ADHD, parent perspectives and parent-teacher relationships. And this was really trying to understand what the experience was of um, having a child with ADHD in school. So, not related to any intervention, but we want we realized that interventions were going to be delivered into schools where uh, there were a mixture of ways of trying to manage students with ADHD and the experiences that people had of having an ADHD, um, having a child with ADHD in school would impact on the experience of those interventions. So our initial question for this part of the research was uh, what are the school related experiences and perceptions of parents of pupils diagnosed with ADHD? So um, using the um, SPICE um, framework, the setting was schools, the perspective was parents of children with ADHD, we were interested in school related ADHD experiences, uh, no comparison for this one, and we are interested in parents' perspectives and experiences. This table tries to summarise quite a complex um, synthesis, but what we found was that mothers felt silenced by their experiences of having a child with ADHD in school. So there was a um, conflict between teachers as professionals and parents as amateurs with um, teachers or parents perceiving that teachers were critical of um, parenting skills leading to parent teacher conflict as being the norm. There was a sort of cultural dissonance between what people expected um, to happen in school and what their experience of schooling was. Uh, because parents felt um, sidelined and not listened to um, they started to use what was termed the weapons of the week, so refuting any criticism that the teachers had of their child and their experience in schools. They felt that their needs were silenced um, and that their expectations of how the school was going to help them were not met. Um, and there was also a feeling in some of the papers that schools exacerbated or originated some of the ADHD symptoms that their children um, exhibited. So this was, a this was a qualitative evidence synthesis that really tried to understand the uh, experience of the parents of having a child with ADHD and how supported or not they felt in schools. And we then went on to try and understand, well, what were the experiences and attitudes of um, a range of stakeholders towards these um, non-pharmacological interventions for ADHD in schools? So this was building on that baseline of understanding what parents' experience of ADHD in schools was anyway, to layer on top of that and what kinds of things happen, uh, what kinds of experiences do they have? in relation to interventions, which we're trying to manage uh, behavior. So um, for this paper, it was a systematic review of qualitative research on the experiences of and attitudes towards non-pharmacological interventions delivered in the school settings. And our, um, our aim with this was that we felt that by focusing on the experiences and attitudes, the review could provide insights into how, why and where school based interventions may or may not be successful. And that thinking about the attitudes of those using the interventions would help to identify aspects of interventions that determine whether these interventions are acceptable and used and to help inform the design of future interventions. So this is really um, 
thinking about feasibility, acceptability, um, and some aspects of interventions. And in this case, we um, used a SPICE um, kind of um, structure framework. Again, it's schools, but the perspective was much broader. We were interested in all of the stakeholders, so educators, children with ADHD, their parents and their peers. We were interested in any non-pharmaceutical intervention to uh, manage ADHD in schools. And the comparison was none or any comparison group. We were interested in understanding the experiences and attitudes of those groups. And again, this is um, quite a complex um, synthesis. This table is just trying to summarize the findings that we had, which were more related to interventions. So um, the, one of the themes was that um, interventions needed to be individualized to um, the needs of the of the student with ADHD and in particular those interventions which led to participants being withdrawn from their regular um, classroom activities uh, it was very variable whether or not participants thought that that was helpful and that needed to be taken into consideration um, the degree to which the interventions were structured or flexible um, was um, again showed different opinions between these different stakeholder groups about the importance of that and children, uh, teachers tended to think that students with ADHD needed very close um, supervision, which was not always appreciated by um, the students themselves. We identified some barriers to effectiveness. Um, so um, the difficulties of the teacher working with the child with ADHD versus orientating themselves to the needs of the whole class, issues of resistance and indifference that um, students had to the different interventions and the amount of time that was available to do that. Um, and then finally, we had this, this list of um, things that the stakeholders believed might influence whether or not a particular um, intervention was successful or not. So I'm going to just draw to a close there. I've been talking for um, 40 minutes or so. Um, so I've tried just to whiz through um, some examples of the range of different questions that qualitative evidence synthesis can address, the way in which um, I think those questions that are asked in the format of barriers and facilitators can be a bit restrictive, and to offer you some ways of thinking about how to structure questions, which um, will help with the review, but also can talk across that whole range of different policy stages at which qualitative evidence synthesis might be useful. I'm really happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'll briefly just put up the slide which has got the references on it in case anyone wants it I think the slides will be available afterwards so if anyone has questions please either unmute yourself or just put yourself uh, put the question in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them thanks very much for your attention Hi, Ruth. So it's Howard. Uh, Hi. Howard White. Hi. So thanks so much for your interesting presentation. I was wondering what your advice is regarding pre-specifying expected bias and facilitators for purposes of coding or waiting to see what you get. So there are a number of different approaches to the actual synthesis step of um, qualitative evidence synthesis. And one of those is called frame, a framework synthesis where if there is an existing um, if there is an existing framework which seems to offer a wide range of possible 
um, findings, then that can be used as a as a pre specified framework. Um, a lot of people who are less experienced with qualitative evidence synthesis tend to find that kind of deductive coding more straightforward. Um, but obviously there are risks with that as well as you might try and sort of squash things into the existing framework for coding rather than allow the codes to be more inductively developed. So it kind of depends on the method. It depends on the question as well. If you're working in an area where there's already um, a, a well-developed sort of theoretical literature around the factors that matter, then um, you know, it might not be so helpful for you to try and reinvent the wheel. Um, but yeah, so there, there is a range of approaches to synthesis and it depends on your experience, the question, the availability of an existing framework, which is broadly ac accepted as meaningful. Um, and yeah, the type of synthesis that you're doing. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I had probably on mute. On muting. <laughs> Don't worry. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Uh, hi, this side Suchi from Campbell, um, South Asia. So basically, um, just, I don't know, uh, basically I really want to know, is there any reporting framework that we can use for qualitative synthesis finding? Yeah, so there, there are a couple. Um, there's one specifically for um, meta-ethnography, which is called Emerge. Um, and then there's another one whose name briefly escapes me, um, called Entrec. I'll put them in the chat. So Entrec is for generic um, reporting and Emerge is for specifically um, metroethnography. Okay, thanks. I just dropped the links in the, in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. I just go check it. Um, can I ask one more thing? It's like, I think so. It's like, it's regarding the, uh, like if you do a mixed method review, uh, mm -hmm. so basically it's like, it has a, it has a quantitative, like effectiveness studies finding as well and also quantitative, uh, qualitative synthesis. Um, what will you suggest? Like, it's good to combine both quantitative and the qualitative synthesis. Or it's like, it's, um, it's better that we actually differentiate and then uh, mention what we found from the quantitative synthesis and also mention what is we found in the qualitative synthesis. And then, um, and then later on, we just like summarize um, uh, what is the main finding that we got from the both? Like how <laughs> best is to report okay. it? <laughs> so this, it's a really, really good question. I've just delivered a three-day training course on mixed method synthesis. So I'm not sure how easy it is to give you a simple, you know, one size fits all answer in, um, in this um, session. Um, but it, yeah, there are a number of different approaches to doing um, mixed method syntheses. So you might do them sequentially. So for example, you do the qualitative evidence synthesis. For example, you want to know which outcomes matter most to participants. So you do a synthesis of the qualitative research to try and understand that. You then use the findings of that to inform which meta-analyses to prioritize in the quantitative um, evidence synthesis in the meta-analysis because you've used understanding of what the participants value to inform what matters in your meta-analysis. So that's one way. You can do it the other way around. You can do 
the quantitative um, review first and then use the qualitative research to try and understand why there's differential effectiveness, for example. Um, you can do them in parallel and then try to bring the whole body of evidence together at the end to understand more of a um, holistic picture. Um, or you can use a method like um, realist review, which uses both quantitative and qualitative evidence together in a sort of single product. So there's a whole range of approaches to doing mixed methods. And it, and it, it, depends, it depends what you're trying to find out. Um, it depends whether the questions for the quantitative and qualitative are convergent or they're separate. So for example, if you want to know what's the impact of a particular intervention, you might use both bodies of evidence to answer that question because there'll be some impacts that the quantitative hasn't measured that the qualitative um, answer. So they're effectively, you're using both bodies of evidence to answer one question, or you might have, um, a, a question about effectiveness from the um, quantitative uh, research, but then you also want to know about issues of implementation from the qualitative research. So you might do those separately and then try and bring them together to understand. So I think there's no one or simple answer to your, um, your question because it depends on what you're trying to do with the different bodies of evidence and how you're trying to how you think the two bodies of evidence can speak to each other. Thank you. I think so this answer some of the sections. So basically, um, maybe I can talk about it like it's actually we are actually seeing, um, seeing the effectiveness of the intervention. And we uh, plus it's also have a barriers and facilitator as one of the research questions. So effectiveness of the intervention, we are ha have a effectiveness plus barrier and facilitator. Uh, also answered by process evaluation and also we are including qualitative uh, studies where the effectiveness of the intervention is also studies so like it has all the three components to it yeah what so the qualitative synthesis is also looking into the barriers and facilitation plus it's also looking into the effectiveness of the intervention yeah so i i think it's difficult yeah it's difficult to say but i think you would probably want to do um synthesize the quantitative evidence, synthesize the qualitative evidence, and try and bring them together to understand what the implications of what you're finding in the qualitative work are for the, um, for the findings in the quantitative review. There are also methods where you can formally test hypotheses. So um, qualitative comparative analysis, for example, you can use um, you can formally test findings from the qualitative evidence synthesis to see whether or not they have an impact on the effectiveness in the quantitative evidence synthesis. But you need quite a lot of studies to be able to do that. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. I can see there's a couple of questions um, in the chat. So one from Steph Howard is, uh, would the PCOS and SPICE search strategies be used for different types of research or for another reason? So the, the PCOS and SPICE um, are frameworks for developing your question. So yes, they can inform your search strategy as well, um, but, they are used because the questions you're asking are different and typically um, because you've got different types of questions you also have different types of research which inform the reviews so i hope that answers um i hope that answers your question and then I have a question from Sabina Singh, which says, which framework would you suggest for a qualitative evidence synthesis where one's interested in contextual variations of a particular intervention, particularly implementation issues of a particular intervention in different contexts? So I think 
um, what you're asking there is um, which um, question framework you would use for that. I think the qualitative evidence synthesis you describe is where you're interested in how different contexts might impact on um, the way in which an intervention is implemented. Um, so I think you could use either the spice or the spider um, framework for that because you're you want to think about things like which settings you're interested in. You want to think about the which um, actors in the system. So is it about the people delivering the intervention, the people receiving the intervention, policymakers, perceptions, and so on. Um, so yeah, I think either of those would work fine for your question. I hope I've interpreted what you've written correctly. So I, I don't see any more questions. So I think um, we're about five to the hour. We've been going nearly an hour. So uh, thank you very much um, for your attention. Um, have a nice day or evening or morning, depending on where you are. Thank you very much. <laughs>